Oh, Let's see. So yeah, yeah. Straight through. We're good to go, chaps. Champion. Okay, yeah. <coughs> so, Kia, thank you for coming along. Not at all. Good to uh, be here. You're auditioning to be Prime Minister. Yep. You're going to be vilified. You're going to be misrepresented in the press. Poor old Ed, all he had to do was eat a bacon sandwich <laughs> to be public enemy number one. Given the job is going to be clearing up 15 years of Tory mess, why the hell do you want to do it? Are you a masochist? Uh, well, uh, it's a question that's come up in the hustings because we all get this question about the vilification of the press. Yeah. And I have to say, I mean, every Labour leader gets it. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. And you've just mentioned Ed. I think Jeremy got it worse than anyone, um, yeah, yeah, in all yeah. honesty. And he didn't just get it during the general election campaign. He got it for the whole time that he was leader of the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to recognise that um, that is not done without purpose. It is done to undermine the leader of the Labour Party and to make it less likely we get a yeah. radical Labour government. So are you going to deal with that? Um, well, we do need to di diversify the press. There's no question about that. But we have to face up to the fact that there are consequences to losing elections. And one of the consequences is that we will go into the next general election with the press in exactly the same place as they are now. Uh -huh. Because Boris Johnson is not going to reform or do anything about the press that makes it more likely that Labour get into power. So, so, so with the consequences, we've got to go in with the same backdrop. Um, and only if we get in can we actually be serious about doing anything about yeah. it. One of the things that's been floated then is the idea of a Labour free sheet. My brother's a broadcast journalist, he said that way back in 2015, what we should have done was put money into getting a good TV producer and just having Labour internet TV channel. Is that the sort of thing we need to be doing? I don't know. I mean, I, 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 it was Rich Bergen, I think, put out the idea yeah, did, was yeah. it, of, a, of a free sheet. But I think avoiding the sort of what we call the mainstream media is a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is, and not all of it is bad. I mean, you know, we do have strong independent journalism, um, and I think we need to engage with that rather than just bypass it altogether. So, um, well, a big part of this is the leader can be seen as, you know, if we use a football analogy, you're an Arsenal fan. You could be the centre forward trying to score the goals out there in the media, making the Labour Party making the case. You can be seen as the manager coming up with the tactics, managing the team, it, all over the policy keeping your MPs in line, which is not going to be easy, no matter who wins. Um, or you could have much more like the, the chairman of the board role of, of how, what do we do with party resources, where does the direction go? You can't do all three. Yeah. You've got 24 hours in a day. What, what's your I, I, I think I'm going to go for the manager role. Now, right. if you'd asked me 20 years ago, I might have gone for the striker role, but this is, this is a reflection <laughs> of my... I still yes. play football every week. Or yeah. my I'm not on a campaign like back. this. Yeah. Um, ask me 20 years ago, and I'd have said, you know, uh, or on pitch, but now I'd accept the, the management role, but not the board role. Right. I think sitting back is wrong. You can see um, it's what Boris Johnson's trying to do, which is to avoid any responsibility. For or anything. turning up when people... Not turning up flooded. in Parliament, not being there when the floods are on, yeah. showing pretty well a disregard for, mm. um, for many, many communities. Well, that's interesting. That was a straight answer, which we rarely get these days. Mm. Um, so you see it as much more of making sure that the party is an organisation fit for purpose. Yeah. One of the most important things is unifying the party. We've been taking lumps out of mm. each other. Um, we're too divisive. And if we don't change that, we won't win the next general election. Yeah. So we have to unite. Um, that doesn't mean everybody agreeing, because <coughs> you're never going to get that in the Labour Party. But it does mean creating an environment which people can respectfully disagree and come together and make a decision and move forward. Well, there's a section on your website which I read about unity. It's quite yeah. expansive. There's a lot in there. Some of that is about empowering members. Yep. I noticed you put on bits there about empowering mayors, which I like very much, Yes. Um, as you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> um, declaring interest on this one. The challenge you've always got in unity is there are people who are fundamentally opposing views. How do you bring them together? Yeah, I mean, it's true you get differences. Of course you get differences. We've got 580,000 members. Yeah. I don't actually agree with you that they're so fundamentally opposed that we can't bring people together. And, um, you know, that saying that there's more that unites us than divides us is really, really powerful. And, uh, and in this campaign, I am detecting um, our membership wanting to turn a corner and recognising that if we just keep taking lumps out of each other, we're going nowhere. Now, I realise that each candidate will see, to some extent, what they want to see. Mm -hmm. But in the hust I have to say, in the hustings, the LGBT ones are put on one side because that did descend into um, factual arguments. Um, all of the other hustings have been very good-natured, hundreds and then thousands of members, I think, genuinely wanted to find out what the candidates have got to say. And actually having the candidates modelling 
um, behaviour where we're not taking lumps out of each other bodes well for the future of the party. That doesn't pre I'm not pretending it's easy, but even in our campaign, we've been able to bring together different parts of the party, and I'm conscious of the fact that if I leave the Labour Party and ask for unity, I've got to demonstrate that through my campaign and as leader of the Labour Party, because yeah. you can't ask others to do something you're not doing yourself. Now, that's very much my reading of it, you know, as, as someone who tends vast amounts of Labour Party mm. meetings, spend more time with the Labour Party than I do with my family, is yeah, <laughs> you're in yeah. the same position. You don't get that when you speak to people face to face in the Labour Party. Labour Party meetings aren't abusive. You know, this is a, a myth that's built up by the media. What happens though is you get some people briefing. Now that's going to be one of your challenges. Yeah. You're going to have, and it's fair to say, I'm not going to name names, but you have MPs who get a bee in the bonnet and they spend more time attacking other Labour MPs and the Tories. How firm are you going to be on that? Well, I think there are you know, we will always have disagreements in the Labour Party, mm -hmm. in the PLP. But it's how you handle it. And, and no doubt now there'll be MPs who are saying what they want to say. In a shadow cabinet, um, it should be possible to have confidential discussion without people briefing out and leaking out. And I agree completely with Jeremy Corbyn when he was trying to get that within his shadow cabinet. Um, and some people were leaking and briefing out. I never did it because I believed in the confidentiality of those mm -hmm. meetings. You've got to have a place where you can have a blunt conversation, frankly. But um, if you think, look at what um, Boris Johnson did, and I'm not advocating it, um, he just took the whip away from 25 Tories and had done with it. Now, I'm guessing from your facial expression, you wouldn't go no, that far. I don't, I don't what think... What would you do? If, you, if you're going to go for unity, you've got to inspire people to come together. You can't force them to come together. Mm -hmm. and, and disciplining people to be united is going nowhere. So the only way in the end to unite Labour Party is to be very clear that's what you want to do, to recognise there will be different views and to reconcile them, um, and to have a culture and a spirit where people genuinely want to pull together. I think that is possible. <coughs> um, and to be honest, and this, you know, maybe I've done other things in my life. I've worked in the civil service. I've worked in legal teams, etc. I've worked in Northern Ireland. Wherever I've worked, people have disagreed. <laughs> this yeah. is not unusual um, about staffing matters, about policy matters, about a decision that should be made. And they usually have a pretty blunt conversation. Then they come to agreement and they sit with it and work with it. And in, in my experience, the civil service happened all the time. We had board meetings where there were differences, had staff meetings where there were differences, but then we all get on with it. Bringing people together, it's, it's a real trick. Um, yeah, but it can be done. And it's, it's actually it's sort of quite a lot of fun when you yeah. work your way through it, you know, if you're willing to listen. What I found is the most effective way is that everybody wants something. This winner-takes-all attitude in NEC slates, everything else, makes the stakes high, and that's what winds people up. And I, I think you've hit the nail on the head, because at the moment, for some people, asking which bit of the past are you from is more important than what are you saying. Um, and that's a big part of the problem, I think. If we can get through that, we'll be making a big step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. All of the candidates are, quite rightly, wanting to improve public services, yeah. wanting to clamp down on tax avoiders, yeah. all of these sorts of things. It used to be the case that in the Labour Party, particularly in the Blair years, no one would say we're a socialist party. Now everybody says we're a socialist party. Um, That's a good thing. But there's very few people as yet saying, and by the way, that entails replacing capitalism. Would you be comfortable saying that? Well, I describe myself as a moral socialist. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is that uh, I profoundly believe that if we're to get out of the difficulties we're in, we've got um, gross inequality, we've got to take radical action. The, the theory that um, if you leave the market al alone, wealth will trickle down it is a busted myth. If that were the case, we wouldn't have the inequality we've got. And I don't just mean wealth and income. Um, as you'll know, health inequality yeah. has gone through the roof. Age um, expectancy, life expectancy has gone down in some parts of 21st century Britain. And there can be 10, 14 years life expectancy yeah. difference between different areas. If you're going to deal with that, you've got to do pretty fundamental things. And I think we've got to have the courage to say the economic system, the free market economic system is busted needs to be replaced with a new economic system where model where government sets the direction or sets the framework. I actually think good businesses would work with that. Mm -hmm. You know, look at the, the key or some of the key problems in our economy. Short term investment for quick returns is killing our economy. So you need long term investment. Poor conditions, poor pay, insecure work. 
is killing our economy and we're destroying the environment in the way we run the economy. The well, government's got to do something about that. Absolutely. Let's run through some of these because you've put out your yeah. 10 pledges. Um, I got this through the post. You Thank got you that very through much. the post. Good. Yeah. Number one, economic justice. Clamping down on tax avoidance. That's not an easy thing to no, do. Of course it's not an easy thing um, to do. It, so it, would it, you be willing, for example, to change, advocate for a change in the law that would require company directors to be on top of this and they go to jail if they're tax dodging? I, I would be very happy to look at a change in the law. I, for five years I was Director of Public Prosecutions and yeah. we, we had a fraud department, one of the purposes of which to, was to deal with tax avoidance. I felt we didn't have enough power. Uh -huh. um, but knows. there's a massive shortfall there. The, the tax gap is in billions and billions and billions of pounds. Yeah. And of course it... Dealing with that is massively popular. I don't care where you are in the United Kingdom. Go out to any pub, club, cafe and say to people, do you think it would be better if we were able to stop people avoiding tax? Well, it's it's and innate they would in say human yes. psychology, isn't it? That nobody likes people jump in the queue. And well, that's what you're talking about, is uh, people getting something. Hang on, we're paying tax, we expect you to pay tax. And, the, and they know that it, it, it's gone through the roof and something needs to be done about yeah, it. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's been suggestions... I'm not going to press you for an answer on this one, but for example, a turnover tax is the way to do it. Well, I, I genuinely think we need to sit back and have a review. You yeah. could look at turnover. You know, should revenue be the thing that we focus on? Yeah. I agree that we need to look again. Now, I'm not pretending I've got all the answers to this. You'd have to delve into the yeah, detail would. of it. Of course, um, the other aspect that we need to focus on is this has to be international enforcement action. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we have to hammer out deals with the EU, for example, and other countries, because if we don't do that, it's just too easy for people to move their money across borders. So, social justice. When we're talking about benefits, I think, as a society, we've now become conditioned to that once you're out of work, you're on almost no money. It used to be that you paid your national insurance when, if you're unlucky enough to lose your job, you had a significant proportion of your existing income. Is that the sort of thing that we should be moving well, back to? Well, you've hit on something really important, which is over the last decade, two decades, the, the disparity between um, what you have to live on if you're um, on benefits compared with if you're in work um, has got much, much bigger. Mm. Um, and we, we probably need to sit back and ask a slightly different question, which is what is the basic amount of money, income, call it what you like, that a family needs to live a sustained life? Um, rather than what's the minimum we can get away with with benefits. And universal credit, I mean, as you mentioned, in a sense there's nothing wrong with a, a benefit being universal, but what the government did was use that change at the same time as trying to take huge amounts of money out of the system and, of course, then have a, a, a scheme that meant you didn't get paid um, in advance, you got paid in arrears, which has caused no end of problem, which is why it's got to go. Mm. Let's um, move on to devolution. Um, Andy Burnham, um, yeah. one of the other Northern Metro mayors. I know Andy very well. I used um, to work in Andy's team in the Shadow Home office. Yeah, so yeah. A good friend. Um, I have a lot of time for Andy. He's a good bloke. Um, he said, uh, if we leave the whole question of devolution the regions and the North to the Conservative Party, we will be making a catastrophic, catastrophic historic mistake from which we may never recover. They've sent you and the other candidates a list of eight questions. Um, I checked if they'd had an answer. As of last night, they haven't. Right. So I've, let's get some of them. Well, answers. I haven't. I, mean, I, I know you're my, busy. My, well, it's not just that. <laughs> it's that um, loads and loads of pledges come in yeah, by yeah. the barrow load now from everybody. Um, I think Sadiq put some out the other day. Andy's put some out. I will. And if Andy's watching this, he'll be saying, "You better have a look at them." Uh, <laughs> I will look at them and go through them. Um, well, let's have a look. So the most important one. Number eight is, will you agree to set up a commission with Metro Mayors to report back within 12 months of you being elected as leader to examine the opportunities to devolve powers to city region mayors? Uh, yes, I would. I'd actually go wider than that. I think it, um, and I almost think that devolution is the wrong word. I think we should start asking the question, why can't a decision be made closer to yeah. people? And then you only elevate up a decision or an issue if it genuinely can't be resolved at whatever the level is it's put at. Yeah. So instead of seeing this as Westminster and Whitehall saying, well, we'll parcel out this power, we'll parcel out that power, I actually think you should turn it on its head now and mm -hmm. say, well, is this a decision capable of being made at the level, a different level? And if so, it should be made there. If, of course, it then involves a wider regional issue or a national issue, then you, you have to push it up. But I think we, we're well, there's inverting a lot of support the... support for this. Yeah, so, I mean, if anything, on Andy's, so on, on the on the pledges, I'd certainly go that far, but I'd be very interested in going further. Mm. I mean, not just, frankly, for the regions in the northwest and the northeast, where I think 
the, the sense that decisions about people should be taken close to people is really, really profound. I mean, it ran yeah. right through that referendum. Um, and because I was Shadow Brexit Secretary and came from a seat that was so Remain, I spent a lot of time in leave areas in the last three and a half years. And um, the three messages that people gave me everywhere I went, um, particularly in this region, were we need better infrastructure and transport, yep. we need jobs with real dignity and security, and we want to make our decisions about what we do ourselves. Yeah, and it was a pretty compelling community case. Community well-filled. But I mean, yeah. the, I mean we probably haven't got time in this interview now, but there's then the question of Scotland, because um, we spent a lot of time saying how we're going to win back the Midlands, the North West, the North East. Yeah. Profoundly important question, but also how do we win Scotland oh. and North Wales? And um, I think without something profound on devolution, um, it's very difficult to see how we tread that well, path. Maybe we'll, we'll see what the outcome is. Yeah. Um, if you win, we'll pick this up in another interview. Actually. Yeah, well, let's do that. Yeah. Let's genuinely do that. Yeah. And I, I mean, and now I'm going to say something which probably isn't in your question, but is really, for me, very important. I think there's too much gap between the leader of the Labour Party and our mayors and our council leaders and Scottish Labour and Welsh Labour. Yeah. I think we, it, it operates as if they're all separate spheres. Why don't we give a bigger voice and influence to those that have actually won an election and are exercising powers in the regions, in their local authorities? And lots of our elected representatives are doing pretty innovative stuff yeah. in difficult circumstances. So I actually would close that gap. It's not about telling our mayors or anything else what to do, but it is about saying, let's have, share your experience and have you close to the decision-making body. Well, that's great to hear, and I'm sure Andy yeah, and Steve will so be very we, happy. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, so we may be having this discussion, I hope. Yeah. Well, just to finish on a, a couple of questions um, about key of the person, um, what are you rubbish at? What am I rubbish at? Um, quick fire questions about what. <laughs> oh, uh, what do you know what all the candidates have? <laughs> we, you know, we've all we've all pushed back. So whenever even Victoria Derbyshire said, "I want yes no oh, questions," no. and we wouldn't give them. I love that. It was a Channel Four one where you almost yeah, sort of we just rebelled. Said we're not doing yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Journalism in this country needs to be much less adversarial. They get better answers. Um, if you were in Game of Thrones, who would you be? Well, I don't know because I don't watch Game of Thrones because in our household um, we got two young kids, so. Um, when we actually get to watch what we want to watch. My wife watches Corridori and I try to watch football. Um, so that's what we do. Um, fantasy dinner party. You can invite three people from anywhere in history. Who are you going to invite? Wow. Who am I going to invite? I have to say Nelson Mandela. I did meet him once in South Africa when I was on a delegation, um, which was really, really, um, you know, fantastically mm. um, significant. Um, who else would I invite? Probably, um, I'd have to have Keir Hardy, wouldn't I? Just to find out what my namesake was like. Yeah. Um, and then one very powerful um, woman, I, someone from the suffragettes, I think, to see, and bring them together and have that conversation. And Emmeline Pankhurst was actually, she taught the suffragettes jiu-jitsu. Um, and I was a jiu-jitsu instructor for 20 years, so I'd actually love to actually see what sort of moves yeah, well, she was doing. Oh, she's coming then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, final one. If you had more time, let's suppose, you know, you decide you've had enough of politics, what personal ambition would you want to fulfil? <laughs> um, when I, um, you know, what, what would you do if all this goes wrong? When I was younger, of course, um, when I was the age of my son, I wanted to play football. The other thing I've always wanted to do is... Um, there's a bookshop on Kentishdown High Street, which is really calm. Um, and so I wouldn't mind uh, working in there and whiling away the days. Ooh. So you see, if you come to, if, if it all goes horribly wrong, you come to Kentishdown and find me in the bookshop. Yeah. <laughs> Do another interview. <laughs> yeah. Kia, Good. thanks for your time, mate. Nice to see you. Cheers. Happy enough? Good. Do you need a couple of